pleased to have this opportunity to tell you a little bit more about some very interesting results that I obtained during my PhD. And this is just a small part of the overall project that was looking also at contemporary animals like the previous presentation. And we were looking at um, the isotopic variability um, in these contemporary animal tissues across the environmental gradient of South Africa. And we were doing this to better understand the paleo data sets. And the piece of research that I'm going to be presenting today is more of a methodological, um, more about the methodological aspects around tooth position and isotopes. So as most of you probably know, stable isotope analysis of animal tissues is a major tool in ecological and environmental studies. And this is because carbon can tell us about whether or not animals are eating C3 or C4 um, food. And oxygen, as we've just heard, will tell us about the body water in an animal, the drinking water, and the, the um, water found in food. And each of these is influenced by climate or by dietary preference. But researchers working on fossil assemblages are often constrained by the limited number of teeth found and then are available for analysis. So we don't often find the whole mandible, we're often constrained by isolated teeth. So it becomes very important to know whether the isotopic composition along um, different teeth in the tooth row of an individual are consistent so that with different measurements um, are directly comp comparable. And if they're not consistent, then are there systematic differences between the teeth so that we can apply a correction factor before making these comparisons? So here's an example of a tooth row of an ungulate. This is the springbok, Antidorcus marsupialis. So tooth formation takes place very early on in the life of mammals, as most of you probably know. That's, that is in species that don't have continuously growing teeth. So this means that the isotopic composition of teeth therefore reflects the diet of this early part of the individual's life. And the sequence of tooth formation from initial mineralization, crown completion, and root development, and finally emergence, is very similar across all mammals. So here you can see a table. I have the eruption sequence of various species. There we've got Antidorcus that we were just looking at, but also Giraffa, Equus. And what you can see is consistent is that the M1 consistently erupts before the M2, and then finally the M3 is the last of the molars to emerge. So this sequence can then be used to construct a life, a life history of each animal. So this um, slide, this publication shows quite nicely how the different molars form and erupt over a period of time. So here's the birth of the animal with the M1 crown and root formation, followed by the M2, then we've got the premolars, and so on. And so changes in isotopic value of these teeth might then reflect residential mobility or change in diet. So for this reason, the intertooth variation within individuals can be used as a valuable source of information. So as I mentioned, the stable isotope composition of tooth enamel reflects um, this early part of the time when the tooth was forming. So compared with plants, milk tends to be enriched in 18O and depleted in 13C due to the presence of depleted 13C lipids. So teeth that formed early on in life, like the M1, like we just saw, which typically mineralizes while the animal is still sucking from its mother, might therefore be expected to have higher delta 18 O values and lower delta 13 C values when you compare it to teeth that formed post weaning. Of course, the lipid content of the milk might also play a role. Uh, for example, the lipid content of ungulate milk, as we know, is about 3.7%, so the effect of delta 13 C might be negligible. But the effect will be much higher in animals like marsupials, um, um, kangaroos, is, um, because the lipid content is much higher. There aren't many studies that have done actual intertooth analysis. Most have done serial sampling, and a lot of serial sampling teeth. Uh, and these are some of the studies that have um, investigated intertooth differences in, in carbon and oxygen. And we'll just look quickly at, at them. First one is Gadbury, who was investigating fossil bison. He found quite a nice pattern. This is the expected pattern. Here we've got the molar running along here and the delta 13 C value. And you can see that the M1 is um, lower, has a lower delta 13 C value, which is as we expected. Oxygen is not nearly as clear with a lot more variation. Again, you've got the molars and it isn't a, a systematic offset. Zaza was also working on fossil bovids. Um, so they did serial sampling, but they also did it along the molars, which is why I've included it here. Here you can see these are the boxes for the M1s, the boxes for the M2s, and the M3s. 
with the delta 13c running along here. So they, um, you can see that the delta 13c starts off at a lower value, and then there isn't much variation for the M2 or M3. And the oxygen, funnily enough, also seemed to have quite a nice pattern across um, the five specimens. You know, they only looked at five specimens, but you can see that the delta 18 you know, started high in the M1 and then some variation in the, in the M2s and the M3s. Two studies that found the patterning to be less clear for oxygen is Murphy and Wang. And this is the delta 13C for Wang. And they were looking at modern goats, horses, and yaks. And you can see that for the, you can see here the key premolars and the molars, the delta 13C is rather, rather stable. Then finally, De Ambrose was working on equids, and they found quite variable patterns, which they attribute to um, varying birth seasons, and particularly for, for oxygen, which is up here. Um, so here you can see the delta 18O of the precipitation running along here. They've, they um, fitted their delta 18O of the two individuals as examples over this time frame. And in both of these examples, you can see the M1 has the same value. But in the example A, if they say that if the M2 has a lower value than the M1, then it's most likely following this pattern and the animal was most likely born in autumn. And here, if the M2 has a higher value, then it's most likely following this pattern and the animal was born in, in, in spring. So, um, so the delta 18 of the individual teeth will correspond with the time of the year. So it can become quite complex. And this is just a summary in what, you could, what the bottom line about this slide is that what's in the literature seems to be in, quite inconsistent. So we wanted to test what the situation was in our region. Uh, so here's the African continent, and here you've got South Africa in the southern um, tip of Africa. Our study focuses on larger mammals from areas of near um, natural vegetation. And here are the collection sites in green, and they extend across the winter rainfall zone and the year-round rainfall zone of South Africa. South Africa, as many of you probably know, have a lot of nat national parks, which meant we could collect animals from relatively undisturbed natural environments. And since the region is predominantly a winter rainfall region, it's characterized by C3 plants, um, and that would include the grasses, so all the, all the plants are C3. Um, in some areas around wetlands, you might get some um, C4 grass within this winter rainfall zone. And then in the year-round rainfall zone, the trees and the shrubs are C3, but the grasses are both C3 and C4. So the animals included in the study um, are the arid adapted springbok, um, some two Rathasera species, two data species, and um, the true browser, the kudu. Um, and uh, we sampled as many teeth as were, that, as were present, usually three to five teeth, and the teeth were drilled along the line, extending from the occlusal surface down to the cervix, and this ensured that the enamel collected was representative of the entire period of um, crown formation, and this was to average out any possible seasonal variation. I should mention this was a conscious decision not to do serial sampling because we wanted to see if we could pick up these broad environmental or mobility changes between teeth. So these are the charts for the four um, groups of species. You can see the delta 13C running along here, and the teeth, P3, P4, M1, M2, M3. And each of these lines is a different individual. Um, and for those of you who don't know these species, I've just included a little um, picture. So the first thing to note is the M1s are not always more depleted um, in 13C than other molars. Um, but there are differences between species, which we're going to look at now. Um, and the amount of variation along the tooth row will depend on factors such as uh, whether the food sources were available throughout the year or not, and how much C3 versus C4 uh, plants are being consumed during the year as well. So the springbuck um, is an example of fluctuations along the tooth row, probably being explained by fluctuations in the amount of C3 food sources that are available throughout the year. So you can see this is a three, it's eating mainly browse. Um, so this animal is living in quite a dry area. Um, and so that's probably why it has these uh, rather larger variations. The steenbok, 
um, <coughs> which eats both grass and browse, has quite a large delta-13 C range. And this is probably because of fluctuations um, in the amount of C3 and C4 plants that it's eating throughout the year. So it's more of a mixed feeder. For both of these Raphaceria species, you can see that the M1 are consistently lower than the, than the other molars. Other animals that strongly prefer browse, like this kudu, and to a lesser extent the dacre, um, are going to show less variation, and that's because their food source is available throughout the year. Then looking at the oxygen variation, this will reflect the seasonal variation in the delta 18 o of food and drinking water. Um, looking at the species individually, uh, there doesn't seem to be any systematic um, differences between the delta 18 of the molar. So the M1 is not consistently higher as we would have expected. And this may be because wild animals suckle less than um, these domesticated animals where, we've, where good seasonal patterns have been shown. Um, season of birth is also playing a role. So any seasonal changes in delta 18 O um, of the available water are possibly bigger than the weaning signal in these animals. And so the weaning signal is undetectable. Um, the variation within the individuals is also quite large. It's much larger than we saw in um, carbon. Um, here is the largest range. It's a six part per mole between this P3 and the M3. Um, and of course, the range of delta 18 of rainfall in Cape Town has been shown to vary up to 11 parts per mole. So this would contribute to this larger amplitude that we see uh, when we compare it to carbon. Of course, the delta 18 of faunal tissues will, be, will average out this precipitation signal to some extent, um, not only because the average of the averaging during tissue synthesis, but also because waters. Um, because this oxygen is not only being derived from water, it's also being derived from the food. So our study showed that there's limited systematic offset for um, carbon along the tooth row, but it's quite species specific. So some species show, show a more systematic offset than others, but almost none for um, Delta 18 o. And for animals with tightly constrained birth seasons, it will depend on whether or not there are seasonal fluctuations in, in the oxygen. Um, and also it will depend on seasonal fluctuations in, in the availability of food and water. Thank you, and I'd just like to thank our funders.